All right, I think we're up live. Yes. Okay, I'll maybe wait a, a few minutes for people to trickle in. Um, I'll start with uh, an introduction first, maybe. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining today's session. Uh, here, uh, my name is Vicky uh, Victoria, but you can call me Vicky. And uh, I'll be speaking on inclusive design, unleashing the inclusive mindset. Uh, Yes, so, so that's my, the topic for today. I hope everybody's excited. I think everybody's coming from different parts of the world. If you can give a shout out for where you're from in the chat. Um, yeah, um, Elham from Toronto, nice to meet you. Allison from Reno, wow, nice. Los Angeles, Toronto, Singapore. Oh, fellow Southeast Asian, hello, Joe. Jakarta, hi, I'm from Jakarta too. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining in today's session. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited with the energy for Be More Festival. Oh, from Melbourne. That's cool. That's cool. Um, and today, what I'm going to be presenting to you is on the inclusive design mindset. Now, um, here's a quick intro for myself and from the company that I'm in. Um, I'm from 62. We're a strategy and design studio based in Southeast Asia. Personally, I'm based in Jakarta, Indonesia, but our team is global and we're remote. So we are based all across the world. We have team members in Taiwan as well. We have team members in Philippines. Oh no, Malaysia um, and all parts of Indonesia. And what we have clients ranging from startups to unicorns, so a, a great variety. Um, and we've been working with different industries as well. Um, so one of it is in Web, Web3. Uh, we just had a collaboration together with Cyber Kong's NFT project. Uh, we work in the social development sector as well with World Bank and World Resource Institute and a few other financial institutions, banks, um, and many, many other industries as well. So we're really, really uh, fortunate to be collaborating with different industries and different sizes of businesses. But um, two years ago, we actually found an initiative called Project Lima, which aims to look into the different, I guess, lenses of design. So a lot of us think that design is aesthetics, right? About making it look pretty, but we never saw it as a way to problem solve or we never really um, resonated with that. A lot of the younger designers here don't. So we wanted to engage them in that sense, making sure that design thinking can be used as a way for problem solving. And we tried to look into different reports. So the first one of the first reports that we did is on um, positive shifts in the digital landscape. So it covers a bit on holistic thinking, inter interconnected systems, digital well-being. And then we branched into inclusive design, which is a topic that I'm going to be sharing today. And also on, um, and currently we're actually exploring AI revolution and how designers can collaborate together with artificial intelligence. So it's really cool. It's a really exciting project. And a lot of the things I'm sharing here are available in on the website, projectlima.co, um, which you can check out. Um, and But I'm going to be sharing a bit on a few of the findings that we have in that research report. So, okay. Over here, uh, here's just a screenshot of what uh, we did. We covered on um, the landscape of Southeast Asia, how inclusive is inclusive design is perceived in Southeast Asia. In the website, there's also a visual uh, simulator. So you can actually experience going through a website if you were blind. So using screen recording, uh, screen readers and stuff and checking out uh, which is a really frustrating experience, um, which means that we need better kind of designs for these websites and a lot more stuff. We covered a bit on language, a bit on design and stuff. But I wanted to maybe um, check with you on 
who here knows about inclusive design or knows what inclusive design is? Maybe can we bring up the poll? Miriam, yes. Anybody here familiar with inclusive design? We'll just wait for the poll to go on. And while you guys are polling, I'll also um, try to... Oh, oh, oh. Oh, okay. I'm just going through the platform. This is quite new to me and it's very powerful, which is really cool. <laughs> but I'll share a bit on what inclusive design is, okay? So inclusive design, a lot of us may know, uh, is is um, is the method methodology. Oh, 85% says yes. Oh, amazing. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm glad that you're already in the nose of inclusive design, which makes my life so much easier. But for those of you who don't know what inclusive design is, it's um, I'd like to put it as like a process. It's a process of making sure that you are considering all aspects of human diversity. And people usually get it mixed up with accessibility, right? Where accessibility, I would say, would be the attributes or the qualities that make the experience open to all. Now, there's always that question on like, oh, what about universal design? How is that different? So universal design is actually um, used in more architecture, uh, and buildings and uh, and more on that field in the interior design, the architecture field, but they're quite interrelated. So when we talk about inclusive design, I told you that it's like a methodology, a process. Now, universal design would be more of the output, how much it could actually, um, how successful is the design to cater to the different needs of the people. So I would say that universal design can be categorized as a noun and accessibility an adjective, so that attribute. So now you kind of know the difference. This is how I usually um, kind of define the different terms and that would just help you uh, with understanding what inclusive design actually is. Now, I want to talk a bit about uh, inclusive design and accessibility in the Southeast Asian perspective, just to give you a bit of background on our report and what we did in our report. And well, maybe some of you might have known this, um, people who are living, um, well, maybe Singapore is doing great at it, but Jakarta or Vietnam or Thailand, probably not the best. But accessibility is still considered as an afterthought. Nobody really considered accessibility as a main feature or something that needs to be considered from the beginning, which is, which is quite unfortunate. Um, so when we were doing our research, we looked into uh, travel and accessible travel. And a lot of them actually mentioned that, you know, there are just too many steps. Um, there's no ramps. Toilets are really cramped. It can't feel, fit a wheelchair. People had to walk really far. So <laughs> it's really, really saddening and really unfortunate to be living in um, an, an area which is not that accessible and having to think about that, which is why... I do really want to push how we need to start considering accessibility. And one of the posters that stood out to me when we were doing research was this, and it, it was just it was just too powerful. And I was like, oh, and I'll read it for you. Um, to you, it's the easy way, right? But to him, it's the only way, you know, using the elevator. And and it saddens me and it makes me makes me reflect again on like how are we perceiving um, accessibility? Um, I'll give a few pointers on what we found on Southeast Asia. Um, first of all, from the cultural map in itself, what we need to consider when we're designing for Southeast Asia is the distinction on the cultural map. So um, over here, we have stats from the Western countries, US, US and the UK, with Indonesia and Thailand. And we can see the spike in individualism and power distance, maybe a bit in indulgence, but not so much. But what does power distance mean? So power distance actually means the hierarchy or the acknowledgement of hierarchy or power within uh, a, a collective or a group. Now, because of the presence of this hierarchy or hierarchical system, it becomes difficult for people to communicate openly because they're very scared on feeling um, that they're being judged or they're being uh, 
they are being spoken down to, especially from the higher ups. And this results in that communication becomes a more indirect and negative, and like all the negative feedback becomes hidden. How does that translate into our product designs? So here's the screen from Grab, which is a ride hailing. It's a ride hailing app. Started as a ride hailing app, but now it's a, a, a super app on rating systems. People are generally scared to rate anybody a low rating because they're afraid. Oh, is this negative feedback actually going to be good? Is it going to jeopardize myself? But we need to start promoting or give nudges in a way that providing feedback actually could be a good thing, right? So that was kind of like what we understood from like power distance and the behavior. On individualism, obviously a lot of the Asians probably are familiar with this, but we like to do things in a collective. Um, and uh, one thing that we found out when we were on our research for the drivers uh, for Grab is that they look for support systems and these support systems happens outside of the app. So in like WhatsApp groups, which was quite interesting as well. So how can we also play a part in that? How can we also find presence within these WhatsApp apps so that we can also support them better? So that was, those are kind of like different things that we looked into. Now, second part of it is more on the high context culture. Now, uh, on the right side is an app uh, called Tokopedia. It's one of the leading e-commerce app in Indonesia. And on the left side is from Amazon. And can you tell us the difference of context? Like so many words, so many icons, so many colors. It's very vibrant, right? Apparently, a lot of these um, design decisions were made on purpose because people felt more secure with a lot more context. That's the same as well. Same goes as well to um, the J Japanese, right? A lot of a lot of the Japanese visuals are flooded with um, writings, with context, and that becomes more on a credibility side aspect of thing, things. So people connect more context with higher credibility, meaning that they they will trust the website more because they're giving more information. And that was a finding that was very interesting for us because we obviously, as for me, as, from a design background, I would be like, oh, I want something minimal. I want something clean. But no, <laughs> um, apparently that was a cultural thing. I guess it was inspired by a lot of the wet markets within Southeast Asia as well. I have two more points. The third one is on uh, uneven tech infrastructure. Now, Southeast Asia is not well distributed in terms of tech infrastructure yet. Um, in Philippines, for example, this little kid is trying to look for a signal. He starts climbing a tree and looks for a signal and bringing his phone around. Um, and in parts of Malaysia, some areas are still not connected by the internet as well. So we need to take consideration into that. But one of the few findings that we got was that Southeast Asians are very active in their mobile, in mobile in general. They apparently, if you look here, Philippines are scoring 126%, Malaysia 139%, Indonesia is scoring 142%. So a lot of people actually own more than one mobile and at one point, and they're very actually, they're quite they can access a mobile device actually um, easy, easily. Um, maybe more on like the low-end mobile phones because there is quite a wide range now. And a lot of the mobile activity is happening in, in Southeast Asia. But when we think about the mobile internet connection speeds, we're scoring the quite low. So if you see worldwide um, on the, the white bar in the middle, and you see the yellow dots. So the yellow dots are the ones that are in Southeast Asia. I think the ones that's scoring the best right now is Singapore. <laughs> but the others, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, and um, Thailand, and the Philippines, still have very low mobile internet connection speeds. So, so it's interesting that there is a high mobile activity, but low internet speed, which I think is something that we need to consider when designing for the Southeast Asian market. Then we look into inequality. Um, there is a high, like there's a wide gap in income inequality in Southeast Asia, which results in a lot of 
sachet buying. So I think in the States, we're where our tendencies are to bulk buy, right? We go to Costco and it's like my favorite place on earth. Let me know if it's your favorite place in the, in the chat as well. <laughs> but I love Costco. But in Southeast Asia, they prefer to buy in these tiny, tiny sachets. And they only have like 50 grams of like soap, 50 grams of like detergent. Um, and that's because their mentality is I'll buy what I can get for today. And a lot of their wages are daily wages so they'll just focus on the day in itself they don't think about long term even though in the end bulk buying might save them a lot more um and uh and that could apply into how we're translating it into our digital products as well can we sell it in lower prices so over here uh we see spotify actually creating a daily price which is like 30 cents for a day um, which makes it a lot more accessible, right? For people who are um, struggling to afford a, maybe a monthly package. And a lot of hacks have been kind of going around where, you know, people have been selling their own Netflix subscription for a cheaper price, maybe sharing it. So these are kind of different hacks that people are going through. Um, yeah. So that's a bit on our report, what we covered in our report. You can check it out as well. We have videos on it, which is super cool and super fun to make when we were doing it it was super insightful for me uh even living in southeast asia uh, but i like to dive deeper about on the inclusive mindset in itself so how do we start thinking about inclusivity so this is a question that i get a lot whenever i'm bringing up in about inclusive design about um designing with accessibility in mind um, we created a, an inclusive design workbook, which is in the bit.ly um, over here. And I can share as well and towards the end the link. Um, so a lot of the topics that I'm covering here are based on that workbook. Right. So what what do we do? What do we how do we start? OK, I'll divide it into like three chapters. Um, and this is where the, the workbook is also divided into. Um, the first part is to understand inclusion. The second is un understanding or building your persona spectrums. And the third is the different inclusive design solutions. So we'll start with understanding exclusion. So after all that chat, after all that background understanding, why does inclusivity matter? Maybe if you can drop in some kind of notes as well. Why, why do you think inclusive design matters? Um, but I also like to reverse the question, you know, like maybe it's not about inclusive design. Maybe it's about missing out, right? Have you ever felt that you're excluded from a group? Have you ever felt that, you know, you're not belonging to a certain group? So I have a story. Um, and this is the, I, I call it the case of nasi goreng. And for some of you who uh, might not know, nasi goreng is one of the famous Indonesian dishes. It's actually, yeah, it's fried rice. It's fried rice. And it's my favorite food. I love nasi goreng. I really, really like it. Um, so one day, I go to a nasi goreng uh, a restaurant, order their nasi goreng. And one thing that I found out was that it was served spicy. And their default, and a lot of restaurants actually default their nasi goreng to spicy. And I, I don't know about you guys, maybe you guys can share as well if you like spicy food or not. But I cannot eat spicy food. I know I'm a fellow Asian who can't eat spicy food. That is such an embarrassment. But it drives me crazy because then I won't be able to enjoy my favorite food in the, in the taste that I'm accustomed with. So it's like, it becomes quite sad and disappointing because then you won't be, won't be able to enjoy the food that you actually love in its, mo it's in, in its maximum state, in its ideal state, right? And that's how I felt. I felt in that moment, I'm like, I can't eat spicy food. My mom's like, why are you, why, why can't you eat spicy food? You're Asian, Vicky. 
and she, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I feel very excluded. <laughs> Don't take away my Asian card. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's how a lot of people feel, right? Like I would probably, I mean, in my case, I won't be able to relate with those people who like spicy food, and I felt like I was missing out on a lot. Same goes with maybe some of you guys are left-handed. Um, in the Asian culture, not a lot of people are left-handed, and so there's not a lot of infrastructure is that is made um, for lefties. So you can tell, like if you're writing, you know, all the ink gets smudged onto your hand, you know, and all the the, the tables they're not designed for left-handed people. So these are exclusions. These are exclusions that you start noticing, right? Whenever you're um, in your daily life, in at work, there are things that, that you can feel that some people could be excluded from it. And that's the thing about designing for inclusion. It starts with recognizing exclusion. Underst and this is this is a great quote, um, Kat Holmes. We refer to her a lot in our report, and she did a, a book on um on des designing for diversity and and she posed recognizing inclusion exclusion as one of the steps to um designing for inclusive dis inclusivity and i thought that was really powerful and within our workbook we actually invited our um the people who i mean like like the readers <laughs> what am i talking about the readers to do an observation study to go to a public space to look and just observe people and find what exclusions there are in the space. And that's where it starts because everybody's background, condition, situation, they're all very different, right? We don't know where they're coming from, their educational background, their psychology, their mental state. And this goes back to empathy, just in general, empathy in general, knowing that, um, you know, everybody is not made equally, right? And that leads me to building our persona spectrums. Um, with empath empathy, being human to design for humans, we need to understand their shoes, their perspectives, so that it becomes a unique solution to us as well. Now, why a persona spectrum and not just a persona? So here are the types of disabilities. Most of us are accustomed to one extreme of disability. For example, the blind, right? We notice that, okay, blindness is uh, a disability. But we never really notice that there are other categories within that spectrum. So blind could be mentioned as like the permanent disability, where else, you know, there are things like temporary, which means that eventually this disability would disappear. Uh, after a certain period of time and there's a situational disability which is a shorter period of time and it could benefit these people as well so for example let's take the blind person case as an example um, people who are suffering from blindness is a permanent disability but who else is in that spectrum it could be people with a cataract or people who just got an eye operation they probably just cover their eyes for maybe a week two weeks right and um and they'll be healed again. But all the products that we're designing for, for the blind would be able to benefit those who are going through an eye operation. Or like situational. For example, you're driving, right? You won't be able to see your phone because your phone is tucked away in your bag. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of mess happening. So there's, there's an advantage as well to design for the blind, but cater towards other disabilities as well. So that's where I'd like to invite everybody. I mean, like within the workbook, we try to look into ways where we we identify different needs, um, the permanent, the temporary, and situational disability, and what is the core need of it? What is it that, what is the underlying problem that they're all trying to face? And that's where we try to create an inclusive design solution, which... So in the end, when we are designing for accessibility, it ends up benefiting a much broader group of people. So for example, the Spotify um, or like uh, Netflix subtitles. 
it might be first for like those who might have um, audio impairment. But, you know, for now, for it's people for who are learning languages or who are not accustomed to the foreign language, they can also access the same content, right? So it's really benefiting a lot more people than we thought it would be. And I'll share a few more examples on inclusive design solutions. We're on our last chapter, guys. Um, the first example that I want to show is touchscreen technology. So these are this is the technology that is powering a lot of our smartphones, a lot of our um, tablets and stuff. Uh, so remember the time when we had keypads in our phones? <laughs> Seems like a long time ago, right? Um, but when they were having that keypad on phone, there was one, <laughs> there was one person who had um, arthritis and he designed arthritis and carpal tunnel. Um, he designed this kind of joystick looking keyboard. And that was the technology that inspired the touchscreen technology. So it was a person with a disability that came about an idea of like, okay, how can we, you know, type better? Because these are very small and tiny keyboards. They're not that intuitive for, for people with carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and it's and it's bad. So in the end, they created this keyboard which inspires the touchscreen technology in itself. And that was an inclusive design solution, right? Like it started off from like a disability and it ended up benefiting a lot more people, us included. And then we talk about virtual assistants. A lot of it is um, maybe catered towards uh, the visual impaired right? They can speak to their uh, smart devices. But now we all use it. I use it to set up my timer, my clock, turn on my AC, you know, smart home stuff. It becomes a lot more convenient for every single one. Same goes with audiobooks, right? We don't need to like read anymore in our transit. Um, we can drive while listening to a book while reading a book where actually in the first place it was made for visually impaired people that they can't read or they struggle to read but now it's benefiting a lot more people and apple they obviously have a lot of things um up their sleeve when it comes to accessibility i really like giving the example of um, apple accessibility website because it's a lot of just things that caters to the niche needs. Um, and I would say I have a certain preference on how I you know, read on my screen, the fonts, right? And that made it a lot easier for me to customize. And it's not gonna be only benefiting me, it's gonna be benefiting a lot more people as well. Um, those with niche needs or those with, you know, uh, because they're disabled and they do need that need, right? Maybe the priority is different, but it benefits a lot more people. But what are the smaller kind of, like these are all very novel, very grand. How do we as product designers or as designers or as product managers or people practicing um, any sort of creating or making consider accessibility or inclusive design? It could start small. It could start just like as Twitter or now X. X um, has their translations, right? Creating more accessible content for people, making sure that all the different languages are catered for. Or if you know Figma, we love Figma and it just makes it so accessible for people from different backgrounds, people who don't have the same platforms. They're not Mac users. They're not Windows users. They can interchange between platforms, it makes it so accessible accessible for designers, for developers, and collaborative as well, because it's web-based. And over here is an, an inclusive design um, decision as well. So um, if you, a lot of the apps behavior in Southeast Asia actually requires you to log in through your phone number instead of your email e email address. Reason being is that Southeast Asians, specifically Indonesians, we forget our email addresses. 
we forget our email addresses, we forget our passwords. <laughs> and we have such a heavy reliant. Um, and one thing when we found during our research is that nobody really changes their phone number, nobody forgets their phone number. Um, and that's where the one time password becomes super handy for anybody logging in. Um, and that was where we finally ended up, you know, a lot, a lot of these changes or a lot of this behavior becomes replicated across different products logging in through your phone number um because again people forget their emails uh i well i don't forget my email but my mom oh how many times do i have to remind her what her email is <laughs> but it's catering to that accessibility adaptive screen sizes responsive screen sizes these are all accessibility um or inclusive design solutions as well, making sure that your content is legible or readable in different size of screens. So the inclus inclusive design could really be um, super broad. It could also be like super small. Um, what it really means is that it could just, uh, it, it just starts with your mindset and how you recognize the different exclusions. It doesn't ha always have to be like a grand scheme of things could start small and that's what I'd like to invite each and every one of you to do as well so yeah at the end of the day um inclusive design is not rocket science <laughs> we try we, we need to try to think of it as uh an ongoing mindset and that's what I also tell the team members at 62 and Project Lima as well that we don't treat inclusive design as one of the agendas that we need to check but as a mindset that we need to keep continue to consider so as a designer are we using the proper colorways um for those who are colorblind for example are we giving enough contrast right are we also thinking about different users so it's really engaging each and everybody on like the inclusive mindset on a daily basis and that becomes a lot more important then, okay, we need to create an inclusive feature. Um, so it's not always about that. Um, and one one question that I get a lot since we have a bit of time um, is how do we con convince stakeholders, right, on inclusive design initiatives? Obviously, there needs to be the awareness, and that's why I'm also sharing this con this information with everybody over here. Uh, the awareness on inclusive design needs to be there. Uh, it needs to always be communicated with people. But obviously, business have their own needs. And that's why the inclusive design mindset becomes um, a bit more powerful instead of like the initiative in itself. Like we cannot really, I don't expect each and every one of the companies to have an inclusive design team to create all these inclus inclusive design initiatives but it's more on like how do we as designers continue to learn and continue to practice inclusive design within our day to day and that would be that that's what i think would count even more from my perspective i'm also still learning there's a lot of things to learn um i love being in southeast asia and the cultural nuances that it brings uh it really challenges me as a designer and a product manager to think about things in a different light and in a different perspective. So yes, I think that concludes kind of my session for today. That was actually quicker than I thought it would be. But you can check out our Digital Inclusive Mindset Workbook um, in the QR code or in the link. Um, and over there, there are different steps that you can go through. The three steps, the three chapters, recognizing exclusions, building persona spectrums, and um, creating inclusive design solutions. Um, and if, if we are super open to feedback, if there are any um, feedbacks on the inclusive design workbook or the inclusive mindset workbook, uh, feel free to let me know if you want to be part of it or be involved in our initiatives um let me know as well um if you have any questions you can also drop them down in uh, the, the chat or i think in the question section i'll be happy to answer any questions um 
but yeah, I'm always looking out for different feedbacks. We continuously try to improve the workbook. Um, we started, I think this is our 1.7 version. <laughs> um, so we're happy to kind of like uh, improve the workbook as well. You can also check out a lot of the materials that I shared today uh, in the different in the website, which is at projectlima.co slash inclusive design Southeast Asia. We also have a video series on it. Um, feel free to follow us on Instagram at projectlima.co or at 62.co. Um, would really love to hear your thoughts as well. Um, uh, yes, so I'm going to open it for any questions. If any um, or not, we can probably wrap up.